Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. There's some very colorful language in this upcoming episode, so please use your discretion. And if there are people nearby that that this may not be appropriate for, you may want to consider using headphones. Thank you. Hello, empaths. We hope you're having a great start to your week. We are going to be discussing some really important topics today for empaths. Do you have a hard time saying no to people? When you have to engage in confrontation, do you tend to freeze up? Are you a people pleaser? If so, we think you're going to enjoy our conversation today with Amy Greensmith. Amy is a certified and credentialed life coach, hypnotherapist, and personal empowerment expert. She uses her roles as coach, writer, podcaster, and speaker to move individuals to a place of radical personal empowerment and self-worth. All, I think, important topics that empaths need to focus on and think about and talk about. So thank you so much for coming on the show with us today, Amy. Yay! I'm so excited to hang out. I'm so excited. Me too. Can you start us off by telling us how you got here? Sometimes I feel that the things we're most interested in teaching are the things that we ourselves were at one point and maybe still are most interested in learning. So are are you a reformed people pleaser? <laughs> no, I came out of the womb totally empowered. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I I think that's really the case for so many people who are in any type of healing modality that a lot of times it was the lesson you needed to learn in in this lifetime. So, my story is kind of rooted in a very conservative born again Christian upbringing. And for a little bit of context, I, I grew up with a father who had a master's in divinity and a doctorate in ministry. So he really wasn't fucking around and was a really beautiful, brilliant, loving, loving man. And he passed away in 07. And for, for a bit of context, my, I have two younger brothers and for, for all intents and purposes, I was the quote, good kid working since I was 14, got married young, moved out of the house, put myself through college, you know, checked all of those boxes. They both did jail time, had trouble with the law, didn't go to school, you know, the the kind of quintessential good kids versus bad kids sort of thing. And then I, I shouldn't say that. I should say slightly derailed or on their on their own journey, learning their own lessons and rebellious. Different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it kind of came to a head in 07 when my father passed. And at the time I was working as a makeup artist and I was kind of working into a transition into personal development. And so I felt very strongly that I wanted to do his makeup for his viewing. And so a lot of people were like, are you sure you want to do your makeup on your dead dad? <laughs> you know, and I was going... Yeah, you know, I'm I'm very sure because I kind of felt like if I had this skill set to say like, oh, dad, get your own makeup artist, I, I felt like it was kind of a dick move. Like I should rise to the occasion. I also spoke to a crowd, the, a crowd of hundreds of people that day. We get back home to my mom's house and I'm kind of feeling like I've I'm winning it, daughter, today. I'm winning. We get back home and she finds it the most opportune time to say that she feels as though my father and her had failed as parents, because the three of us grouping me in with my siblings, the three of us were not quote, walking with the Lord. So that was really the only rubric. That was the only measurement. It kind of, all of these other elements of who I was were kind of null and void, unless I subscribed to the faith traditions of my family. And the only thing that I could kind of muster in that moment was to say, mm, I don't think you should say that to a child. <laughs> and she said, well, that's just how I feel. And that really was a pivotal moment for me where I realized that I could continue to shape shift because up until that point, my husband and I, every time we would go to see my, my family, I would kind of tell him, here's the facade, here's the veneer we need to put in, put in place. No cussing, no liberal agenda, no Jon Stewart, no South Park, <laughs> you know, all like, don't, don't drink, don't cuss, don't, none of that. And that was really sort of, a, a pivotal moment for me where I realized that speaking up for yourself and having boundaries in your life is not always an ultimatum. 
However, in fact, I think it frequently is not an ultimatum. However, in situations where I have to decide if I'm either going to make you happy or I'm going to make me happy, if push comes to shove, I'm going to choose me. And that was the first time that I even entertained that thought of choosing me. And then let me tell you, ladies, it was a shit show. I got completely adversarial, combative. It was like the floodgates had opened. And I was like, let's fucking fight. I want to talk about abortion. I want to talk about gay rights. I want to talk, you know, I was like, let's do it then, you know? And I think I was also a little bit bolstered by the fact that now it was one-to-one instead of one-to-two, right? And, And so it was through many, many situations where I had to kind of take back my delivery with my mom and where I had really made a mess in how I spoke to her that I realized, oh, you can actually give voice to things where you feel completely polarized about something from the other person. And you can do that with the utmost grace and kindness. You can ask adult children to move out of the house. You can ask for a divorce. You can tell someone you don't want to be friends any longer. And you can do all of that without vitriol and malice. And that really became sort of the the impetus behind the work that I do now, which is kind of twofold. It's this internal component of believing in your own intrinsic enoughness, that you matter, that you're worthy. And then the external component of, well, then how do I communicate that with the outside world? What do boundaries look like if I believe in myself? What does saying no look like? What do tough conversations actually sound like? And giving people the verbiage to do that. So, so yeah, didn't come out of the womb, you know, all evolved and (laughs) enlightened. There was a decent chunk of people pleasing that went on there. You just nailed so many points for our listeners that people that we've talked to over the years and both Samantha and I have talked about that when you have to go against what you were brought up in, whether it's religion or politics or economic status or whatever it might be, and you get to that point where you say, I have to speak my truth and be who I am, that takes so much inner strength. And I think that when you've been so conditioned or worn down or encouraged to be a certain person, that, but there, you, you nailed it. There is such a freedom when you say, I can't be who you thought I always, who you want me to be or who you expect me to be. And you offer all these beautiful things, but what would be one step or people could take towards saying, how can I take one step towards being able to find that within myself to be able to stand up and say who I really am? Well, I think the f- I know exactly what, what I want to offer people as sort of a little mini assignment. But prior to that, I think it's really important to underline that people pleasing is absolutely a defense mechanism. It's a way in which we caretake for ourselves. So in personal development, I think there are a lot of concepts that get demonized and they become quite binary. So it's like perfectionism is always wrong. People pleasing, always bad. And it's like, if I'm going for neurosurgery, I need that surgeon to be a fucking perfectionist, right? Like I need that (laughs) to be important. Um, and, you know, in situations like, you know, I, I identify as queer. If I'm in a scenario where clearly there is, it's not a safe environment for LGBTQ+, that's probably not my time to stand up and wave my rainbow flag and talk about, you know, legislation or whatever. In that moment, people pleasing actually might save my life. And it's actually tethered to our primitive fear responses, if you're familiar with the fawn response. People pleasing is just a modern iteration of fawning. But for many of us, that's how we stayed safe as children, right? It was, if I can make everybody else happy, maybe it's an an aggressive parent or somebody who, a caretaker who has an addiction or something like that, where you learned, okay, if I fly under the radar, then I'm okay. So I think that's worth underlining because the first item of business is always to discern, am I actually in danger here by speaking up? And that's a very important piece of nuance because depending on if you are a part of any marginalized community, 
that might not be a safe endeavor for you, right? So I think that's the first piece of business. The second is to examine, this is my favorite place to look for boundaries, is look for any situations that you chronically complain about a specific person or a specific instance and you've done nothing about it. You have not told the appropriate party because oftentimes we will speak up, but we do it to the wrong person. So your therapist gets an earful for like five years or you're pissed at your partner, but your best friend knows everything about it. So we are speaking up, but we're usually not speaking up to the person who can actually tackle the grievance. Now I'm not talking about if you just need to vent or you need to get stuff out of your system, you know, we all need to do that, right? I'm talking about a habitual chronic way of being where every day you come home and complain about somebody, but that person has no idea the depth of the importance to you. I like to say you need to give people at least the opportunity to be what you need. But far more often than that, because we're hurt, and this is a major theme I see right now, is we just would rather label and say, oh, they're toxic. They're a narcissist. And I'm like, are they a narcissist or have you just not spoken up at all? And sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's messy and it's a medley and all of that. But your piece in the matter is to ask yourself, have I given them the opportunity to be what I need? Have I delivered my request or my grievance in a way in which they can hear me? So do a little inventory. Is there anything that I'm constantly complaining about that I have not given voice to? Because if it's worth complaining about, it's probably worth taking action on. That is a great suggestion. Well, once someone identifies that, like, oh, I'm always complaining about this person or my job or what have you, how do you advise people to start that confrontation. Like one thing I do is I'll rehearse it with a, with a safe friend first, Mm -hmm. just so I could kind of get my ideas in place. And when I get to the confrontation part, I'm very cognizant of not using you words and trying to focus it on me and how I feel. And I always try really hard to keep my emotions even and not get upset or nervous or scared or angry. Yes. But what do you do beyond, like, how can someone prepare for that confrontation? I love that you mentioned not using the word you, because there's a a very common, you did this, I feel this, blah, blah, blah. And when we say you, 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 it tends to feel very accusational. And then that immediately puts the person on the defensive. And so they are more likely to say, yeah, but you do this, right? So there are a couple of things that you just mentioned that I think are brilliant. One is going in there with a calm demeanor that you want to elicit from the other person. We know that we have emotional contagion, that we are likely to catch the emotions from other folks. So if you engage in a conversation and you go in there with an air of vulnerability, you are far more likely to elicit vulnerability from the other person. We can't guarantee it, of course, but we know we have a better chance. The first item of business before anything else is conversational consent. Going to that person and saying, hey, there's a couple of things I'd like to run by you, or I'd love to get your thoughts on some things. Do not say we need to talk. But say, hey, there's a couple of things I would really like to get your thoughts on. Do you have some time? Because to your point, Samantha, nobody loves confrontation. I mean, a select few people who are like in wrestling as a profession. (laughs) But like a majority of us don't fucking like it. We're not like sign us up. So think about situations where you've been caught off guard and you're like, and we immediately go into fight, flight, freeze, fawn. We immediately go into there's a sense of threat. Oh, I'm in trouble. And then we call upon our defense mechanisms instead of really being present. So one of the pieces of that is just getting the consent. I don't know if you've ever had that that situation where you try to talk to somebody in your life and they just got back from work or they just got their ass handed to them by their boss and they are just not in the space, right? So we want to set up the conversation to get you what you want. Like that's the whole point of it is to get our needs met, get our, you know, get what we want. So let's set it up in a situation that sets us up for success. The other thing that you can do is 
write it out. Like you were saying, rehearsing it, write it out. And I'll give you sort of a formula. It's sort of a three-pronged formula. Here is the issue or here's the thing that happened. Here's how I interpreted it. And that's what you were pointing towards, Samantha, is that here's how it landed on my side. Here's how I interpreted it. Here's what went on in my mind. Instead of saying, you're this way, you always, you never, you're this, actually saying, here's how it landed for me. It felt as though. And so removing that word you, you can say, it seems as though there hasn't been mutual respect or I feel like there might be a breakdown in the division of labor. All of that stuff is not saying you don't help out enough or, right? It's, we're removing that word. So the first formula is, or the formula goes, here's the issue. Here's how I interpreted it. And now here's my request. And offering that as softly as possible. And then depending on the situation, offering collaboration. Now, that's not always the case. If it's a definitive boundary of like, I will not tolerate this any longer, there might not be collaboration. But if it's like, you know, with a partner and you're trying to orchestrate division of labor in the house, there might be some collaboration to be had there. But I think remembering that if we go in ready to do battle, we're going to get a battle. But if we go in with what a lot of psychologists will call a soft startup, where you use gratitude or you use vulnerability or you own your shit, like just saying like, hey, listen, I really appreciate you having this conversation with me. I realize there's a handful of things that I've been kind of building up this resentment around and that would be wildly unfair to you because you would have no idea. So I want to just share with you what's going on with me. I would really love to hear your perspective as well. That is so more disarming than we need to talk. This, you do this, you do that, right? And so all of that is just slight tweaks in, in semantics and in your paraverbal, how you, uh, your ton tonality of your voice. So a couple nuggets in there. I agree. I agree. And I think it's important when you go into confrontation or not even call it confrontation, but a, a, a discussion to know what you want to come out of that. Yes. Right. I think a lot of people don't know what they really want at the end of that, that confrontation. Yeah. I, I have a friend who's, whose partner misappropriated some funds. And so the two of them did have a confrontation, a discussion about it, and he's still not happy. And I said, well, what did you, what did you want when you talked to him about this issue? And he said, well, I don't want it to happen again. And I said, well, I think I think he agreed and you know that that's not going to happen again. So why are you still talking about it? And he said, I wanted validation. I wanted an apology. And I think if he'd gone into that discussion knowing that was the outcome he wanted, it might have gone better. Right? Yes. I feel like you are just teeing me up for every <laughs> talking point I have. This is so remarkable. Um, yeah. So in that final phase, that third phase of here's my request, one of the biggest elements of the request is specificity. So if, if someone comes to you and says, I need more romance, what the fuck does that mean? Does that mean you want me to write you little notes every day? Do you want me to initiate sex more? Do you want me to plan date nights? Like what the fuck does that mean? If you said something to um, a manager, like, I just need a bit more autonomy or I need you to respect my agents. What, what, what does that mean? So we need very specific linear requests. Now it could also be, I need you to hear me out. Maybe there's something that we don't, we, all we need is just to give voice to it. We just need that person to know that they caused harm or how your what your experience is, but you have to be very, very clear that they may not give you the response that you want. So if you go into it with that as your goal of, I just need them to hear this, you need to be okay if they're indifferent, if they're acrimonious, if they cast blame, if they're receptive, you need to be okay no matter what the reception is. So I think being really clear, in fact, I had a, a friend years and years ago who had an, an issue of 
establishing a boundary with her in-laws and they were Catholic. And this friend of mine was uh, agnostic and did very specifically did not want any Catholicism to be taught to her children. Well, her in-laws would say, if you, if we watch them, we're going to go take them and get them baptized. And we're going to do all of this stuff, which is unbelievably disrespectful and unacceptable. (laughs) And so if this friend would have gone to her and said, I need you to respect our religious choices more, there is so much leeway there. There's so much like bendy. Oh, well, I didn't know if you meant this or that to be specific. Absolutely no church, no conversation about God, no books, um, no baptism, no rituals. Please do not speak to them about any spiritual matters and defer to myself or my husband, right? Like it has to be very, very clear. Like I'm okay if you teach them how to pray at dinner, right? Like these are the very specific steps, right? Because otherwise, especially if you're brand new to establishing boundaries, people go, Ah, uh-uh, Denise doesn't mean it. Uh, Amy doesn't really mean it. Oh, she just listened to this podcast or she went to this conference and now she thinks she's like doing all these boundaries and shit. She doesn't mean it. She's a lifelong people pleaser or she's a lifelong server, right? Like, so sometimes you have to reiterate. And I think that's one of the hardest parts of boundaries is the enforcement piece is, oh, I actually really meant it. And being willing to revisit that conversation and say, Hey, listen, I really did. I really meant that what we were talking about. Maybe I didn't emphasize how incredibly important that is. And then you get to decide when consequences come. How many times am I willing to repeat this before I really do institute a consequence? There have been established patterns, or if there is a strong familial connection, or it's always been the expectation that you're going to react a certain way to what I love is that you really emphasize discernment of when to pick your battles. Is this the hill I want to die on today, but also that it may take more than once and it may take more than you have to have that consistency and keep showing up and establishing the boundaries because as soon as you, um, and I don't want to say show mercy, but as soon as you don't stick to your guns and on your own shit, then that's when it can become a really, um, hard to establish what you really want and what you expect from other people. It's huge. It's so huge. But one of the things that the theme of everything you're saying is a lot of times I'm I'm thinking of interactions I've had where I have been able to speak my truth with someone and the person may not understand where you're coming from. They may not understand. And when you get to that point where you can just really believe and say, because it matters to me. And I think that's a huge, huge step for folks. And it's also very, uh, it really will illuminate the people in your world who are okay and can support you having differences of opinions than they do. And it's up to each individual person, depending on what sort of value is being breached, right? Like some are more more uh, integral to our lives than others. But yeah, I think that's a huge piece. And also understanding that understanding or hearing someone is you don't you don't actually have to understand. You don't have to agree. You just have to respect. And I think we we get that conflated sometimes where we think if I actually hear them out, then I'm agreeing. No, you can say, I can appreciate that. Or I I definitely hear you. I understand what you're saying. I don't have that same experience. I don't necessarily agree. But if you are telling me this is important to you, you are important to me. This is how I feel about kids, right? Like, I don't want kids. I've never wanted kids. Whatever that feeling is of like that maternal thing missed me completely. So do I want anything to do with that? No, absolutely not. (laughs) And I'm very, very candid about that. However, when I have a friend who has a child and it is a desire of their heart and they are so fucking pumped, I'm the one cheering and screaming and like, yes, I'm so excited for you. I don't have to want that for myself or believe that it's my path. 
to be excited for their experience. But that also is going to be very, very different depending on the relationship I want to, and the issue. I want to talk about that a little bit in terms of unconditional love, because I think when you truly love someone, it's, it's a love that's freely given without judgment or anything, right? Like one of my good friends is an evangelical Christian. We don't see eye to eye on that. She respects my beliefs and where I come from, and I respect hers and where she comes from. Going back to your parents, and I could be assuming here, and I apologize if I am, but in that conversation with your mom, it almost sounds like she loved you guys on the condition that you were born again. I was raised with parents who loved us on condition as well, and I have found that very difficult to heal in my life. And I just wondered if you could speak about, about being raised with those conditions that you're lovable if. Oh, this is, this is a very complicated one because I know that my, both my parents, and I've had some great connections with my father beyond, you know, beyond the grave. And I know that they loved me wholeheartedly. Like it was And it's interesting because I've done a lot of work with religious trauma and therapists and working through my own shit. And I don't have a tremendous amount of animosity towards my parents at all. I feel as though they really drank the Kool-Aid, cult pun intended. And they, you know, really, I think, did absolutely what they thought was the best for us. Like, I, I don't remember malice or, and there were so many situations where love was just abundant. So for me, when I look back, I see problems with the institution. I don't see as much issues with my actual parents because there was never an absence of love. There was love and a lot of other expectations on, it was, it was both. It was like a, an, and situation, but this unconditional thing, I think we need to look at that a little bit. Do I believe in unconditional love? Kind of sure. I think it's a great idea. I also think we do need to put conditions on relationships Can you love somebody from a distance with boundaries? Absolutely. But if my husband all of a sudden developed a gambling habit and wasn't, and, you know, left us destitute and wasn't willing to work on it, that would be a condition for which I would leave. If there was severe abuse, if there was infidelity, if there was um, verbal abuse, even that would be a condition for me to change the way in which I love him. And you know, thanks to the Greeks, we have so many different types of love and, you know, there's love between friends. There's love, you know, we have all of these different great terms for love. And so I think allowing ourselves to recognize the conditions that must be present in order to foster a healthy relationship is different than love. We can love from very far distances through different planes of existence, even. So I think it can get slippery and tricky if we're saying, I want unconditional love. And it's like, well, my love would change for you if these different conditions happen. So I think it's just something to explore. I'm curious what you're thinking over there. I think that's a great, great caveat to put on that because I have, I always, I have four A's that you cannot break if you're in a relationship with me. And I'm always open about them. It's um, addiction, emotional abandonment, abuse, and adultery. Nice. If you break any of those, I'm out. And so I am I am divorced, but my my ex and I are very, very friendly. I still love him in a very different way. I remember when he had COVID a couple of years ago. And I was the one who went over and dropped off food and drinks. And all my girlfriends were like, what are you trying to be the next mother Teresa? Like, why are you doing that? And I was like, well, you know, I'm still going to be there for him. When a hurricane came and crashed, trees crashed into my deck, he came over and rebuilt the deck, but we don't love each other that way anymore. But we, we love each other for the experiences we had together and we'll be there for one another. So I, I see what you're saying. That's not really unconditional love. Like I'm not going to accept any of those A's, but I'm still going to 
take care of him if needed and vice versa. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Well, I'm starting to kind of crystallize this in my mind. And Denise, I'm super curious what your perspective is. I'm thinking unconditional love, but conditional behavior. Ooh, so th- that's good. because you do still love him. And so maybe it's unconditional love being willing to shape shift into a different type of love, right? So I would, I would argue that you probably have a friendship love for him. It is not a romantic love any longer. Exactly. Love nonetheless, but there were behavioral conditions that yeah. were not met. Right. right. So maybe that's, maybe that, maybe we solved it. We worked it all out. Denise, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> You're doing your magic, Amy. Uh, I really, <laughs> what I was thinking though, as you were both speaking was when we're the person who changes the rules that you may be in a relationship, you may be, you have set these parameters, you've set the boundaries. And then all of a sudden, as you start to grow and evolve, you realize this doesn't fit who I am anymore. And I have to change the rules. It's really, really hard to be angry at someone else in a relationship. If you own the fact that you're the one that changed. And I think that that goes along with that conditional part, because the conditions are for yourself of you may have been willing to accept or tolerate or, or roll with certain things that all of a sudden you've come into your own enough to say, I just don't want to spend my life like this anymore. And it's not disrespectful to the person it's honoring yourself. And I think that's the premise of so much of your work is you can still love people. You can hold space for them. And and Samantha's example is perfect, but you don't have to do it at the cost of losing yourself or feeling less. And so many of us right now are on the cusp of, you know, I, I talk to a lot of folks and they'll say, I can't really figure out what I really want or who I am. And that's part of this transition we're all going through is I may not be who I've always been, but I'm ready to evolve into who I'm becoming. That's right. And, and what you're saying is exactly that is the conditions can change and shift. The relationship can change and shift, but it doesn't mean we have to lose ourselves in the process. That's right. And it's almost like you'll have various relationships where you are, you're walking alongside one another and then one person starts growing a little bit and their pace begins to quicken. And maybe the other person kind of stops by the road and gets stuck in an ideology or, or a growth stunt. And, you know, we, we start to go, oh, our paces are totally different now, or now I'm way over here. And then we have sort of these archaic notions of how relationships are supposed to be. My personal feeling is that it's a lot of it is rooted in religion, but I think we're supposed to have multiple relationships, romantic relationships in our life in order to learn things. I think we're supposed to have that with friendships. We are going to grow. We are going to change. And, and I hear what you're saying too, Denise, that like that might reach a point where that person is like, I like the older version. I signed up for the older version. I did not sign up for this and I'm no longer happy. I'm no longer, I want to still be drinking and cavorting and carrying on. I don't want to be learning about fucking attachment styles, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You know what I mean? But there's a a brilliant quote by the activist uh, Prentice Hemphill that says, Boundaries are the distance at which I can love both you and me simultaneously. Perfect. And is that not just the most incredible quote ever? And I think they nailed it. It is that I don't want to have to give up my shares <laughs> of self-love, right? I, I, I cannot afford to sell my shares of self-love. So I need to have just as much investment in self as I do in loving others too. And uh, Melissa Urban talks about this when she speaks about boundaries, about how unbelievably safe you feel with people who have boundaries because you know exactly what you're going to get. They're totally authentic. They're not lying. They're not saying, oh, I wish I could, or yes, and then canceling later. You, you know exactly what you're signing up for with those people. And that is such a safe, safe place to be. So we buy into this idea that 
constantly putting everybody in front of ourselves is so noble, but I think it's poison disguised as nobility. No, no, there is a cost at constantly putting everybody in front of yourself. And so I personally find, I think I, I'm going to venture a guess that both of you would agree that the more anchored I am in my own self-worth and my own value and my own boundaries, the more I attract the most incredible, beautiful spirits in my life who applaud that and do the same. And that's a cool place to be. <laughs> and how quickly it can change. Mm -hmm. How quickly once you start to take care of yourself and it's not arrogance and it's not selfishness and it's not any of those negative terms that we may have grown up hearing or learned from situations in the past, it changes who you attract. And I always equate it to if you've been vibrating at a certain frequency and then you change your frequency, you're going to attract in at that level. You're not going to attract what you, where you used to be vibrating. Mm -hmm. And and that happens a lot with relationships where people have brought in the same person with a different face over and over and over again. And then they say, I am so done with this shit. And then they start to attract someone that meets them where they are now. And it's, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. I think there are some anomalies out there too, where you meet somebody who I think they're little gifts along the way. I think sometimes they come in mentorships. I think sometimes they come in friendships and sometimes they come in romantic relationships where you weren't really vibing very fucking high, but they came along and I think they're like a little wink from the universe. Like, hey, bitch, pay attention. There's more available for you. Are you going to step up? Are you going to rise? You know, I think about that a lot of times with, with my husband. Uh, I know that we both have so much individual self-worth, but there were so many things about him where he mirrored back that self-worth that he made my job easier. And I think there's something to be said for that of having relationships in your life that make your job easier and make loving yourself or believing in yourself or going after things that you want easier. So, yeah. That's beautiful. Well, as you've moved from your makeup work to doing this empowerful, impactful work, I'd love for you to tell listeners how you made that, that leap, you know, and, and cause I think we have a lot of listeners who are thinking of starting their own spiritually based business, but they don't know really where to go or how to start. What would be some tips you'd have for people who are doing the work, are focusing on boundaries and, and self-love and investing in themselves. And now they want to invest in their, their own personal career. How did you make this, this leap into your, your beautiful work today? Oh, it was so easy. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> no, it was not. Um, <clears throat> well, I think it, it also depends on your personality type. Okay. I'm a Taurus. I'm extremely organized and I want things buttoned up. I, I avoid spontaneity <laughs> like the plague. I want things. I'll be spontaneous as long as it's on the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> so I need, I knew that if I was going to shift jobs, it needed to be laid out and calculated. So I was fortunate enough to be working for a makeup brand where I could gradually start decreasing my hours. And so I would just do that and add an extra day of coaching until I got to the place where I felt like I could quit completely and support it with my coaching. But I started with very, very small goals. So the first goal was to go through my certification program, I had to have a mentor coach. So my first goal was just to make enough money to pay the mentor coach. And then I just kind of created goals beyond that. And I was really lucky that the coaching school that I went to, it was mandatory that you had five paying clients throughout the six month duration of this, that portion of the certification. So it forced you to start a business. Whereas I know a lot of like become a life coach in 72 hours <laughs> sort of programs uh, don't have any sort of business acumen that's built in or anything like that. So I would say, first of all, get really clear on your strategy. I, one of the best pieces of advice that I got at the very beginning was, especially if you're in some sort of healing art or healing modality, 
it feels so convoluted to be attached to the money and feel like you really need the money because we do, we do to live in a capitalist society. So it sucks to be talking to somebody about their greatest fears while you're afraid if, are they going to hire me or not? Oh, please, please give me money. So I think one of the best things that you can do is make sure that you're financially okay, whether that's taking a business loan, whether that's having a partner who is able to supplement, whether it's a side hustle, something like that, where you're not just jumping into it. <clears throat> now, there are other personality types that if they don't just cut it off and quit right away, they'll never do it. So sometimes you have to, you know, pull the rug out a little bit. So I think it really depends. And it, it, it's about understanding how do I operate the best? And I knew for myself, it would cause me such severe anxiety if I didn't have a plan financially. And I would also say, get support early on, find really great business mentors who actually have great traction and not just they decided to do it yesterday, like make sure that they have, you know, some credentials and some understanding of that, that work. That's one thing that I wish I would have done earlier. I'm a chronic DIYer. And so I was like, oh, I could teach myself how to do that. Oh, I'll do that. I can do that. And I don't suggest that. <laughs> uh, but I also do think that you have to do your due diligence because there's a lot of charlatans who are saying, I need to build websites and they don't really. So it does involve a lot of a lot of due diligence, but I have a, a colleague who has a great mantra of dream plus do. And it's this idea of connecting your vision with your action. So it's not enough to just be visualizing and meditating about the business that you want. You actually have to take action around that. And what does that really look like? So those are those are a handful of ways that that things have been helpful for me. I think also, and I think you ladies will love this, is listening to your intuition when things aren't right. Because everyone and their mom is going to say, you need an Instagram strategy. Or the latest thing is you got to do webinars. Or you got to, and there's certain things that I'm like, that makes me want to pull my teeth out. And that is your intuition saying, hey, bitch, this is not your method. And I think recognizing that or when, or, you know, I'm recently taken a break from my podcast. I had such a strong intuitive pull that I needed a break that it, I, I physically couldn't even hit re record. It was so wild. So I think listening to that and not doing that cognitive override of like, here's what the industry is saying I have to do to be successful, but pairing that also with very conscious action and support, I think is important. Oh, those are such great points. I just had this discussion yesterday. A friend went to see Teresa Caputo live on stage and she was like, Samantha, she was amazing. And I was like, oh, I'm so happy you enjoyed it. And she's telling me all this stuff. And she says, I don't know why you don't do that. And Denise, how many times do you get that too, right? Probably all the time. Yeah. As far yeah. as like, go big or go home kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, and I said to her, I said, this is a debate I've had with myself for about 20 years. If you have something that, you know, you could do or should do, but it makes you uncomfortable. That's a crossroads for me, you know, because it's like, well, do I overcome that fear and push myself through it? Or do I just accept I'm not that person. I don't like the spotlight on me. So that's not my path. What, what do you say to that debate that a lot of us have inside of ourselves with certain fears? That is, I, I swear you tee things up. So <laughs> fear is, okay. So fear is a great one. This is so great because fear gets loud when you're onto something, when you absolutely need to keep going and when you need to abort mission and run the hell away. So we have to discern, am I in danger? Is this just new? And is this really a desire of my heart? So we have to look at those three different questions, right? Because fear shows up in all of those situations. It could be that somebody else who has those gifts would love to do that, but they're so scared of putting themselves out there. They're also having fear. So we have to examine that and go, do you want the end result? 
Like if we were to flash forward and say, okay, here's what it looks like. You're on stage, you tour, you do multiple cities, you've got an online presence. Do you want that end result? Does that feel expansive or contractive? Martha Beck would say shackles on, shackles off. What does that feel? Am I jumping into a pool of water or a pool of mud, right? We have all of the different, <laughs> the visualizations. So asking yourself, like, when I think of that end result, do I want that? In your case, it's, uh, uh, no, uh, I don't want that. In other situations with fear, there's actual danger, right? And this is what we were talking about with the people pleasing and things like that. Sometimes going into a situation, your fear is kicking in because it is actually not safe to do business with that person or whatever. And sometimes that's really tricky because I'm sure as you both know, we lean on cognition more than we lean on intuition. So we will say, write out your pros and cons list instead of feel into it, right? So what we have to remember in those situations is you can always course correct. So let's say you became this stage sensation and you were dying a slow death. You get to quit, right? We get to course correct. And I think we forget that sometimes, especially if we have perfectionist tendencies. I have to get it right this first time. No, what, what decision can I make with the information I have right now? Right now, if I had to go on stage tomorrow, it's a fuck no. So yeah, I can kind of put that to bed. I have a similar situation where everything in my business is scale, scale, scale. How can you scale? One to many model, one to many, one to many. And I would much rather have small groups of women that I mentor and that I work with. That's where I shine. That's where I light up. That's where I, what I'm passionate about. Even things like, oh, you have to go to in-person network. In-person networking makes me crazy. I can't stand it. And so I would much rather connect with people online or do podcast interviews, right? So sometimes it's that, I talk about this with goal setting sometimes, that you might have a very specific goal, but you have to analyze the method to get there, right? So you might want a really flourishing business like I did, but in-person networking was not the method I wanted to use. I wanted to go this path. You want to run a marathon, maybe you want to hire a trainer, or maybe you want to join a run club. The goal is still the same, but we have to analyze maybe the method is off. Maybe I need a different method that aligns intuitively with what I want to achieve. So that's wow. what I would kind of say about analyzing your fear. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. And, and noticing where you shine and honoring that. That's great. hundred percent. Well, you're amazing, Amy, because you just Put it so succinctly, it's very honest and direct. It goes back to my, my one of my favorite bench lines in my whole, whole life is empower, don't enable. And everything that you're talking about is empowering people, not at the cost of someone else, not at the cost of, of unity or, or freedom or any of that stuff, but it's more, you know, really look in the mirror and say, what do I want my life to look like? And when you were just talking about your business stuff, I what kept coming to my mind was, Am I having fun doing this? Is it bringing me joy? Am I am I bringing my energy to this with such love and compassion that I just I'm excited to do it? Or does it feel like, and I'm not discounting. I'm, I, I agree with you 100. percent Huge fan of a side hustle. Mm -hmm. If you are putting the pressure on something to support yourself or people that you take care of, and it's that's not giving your business a fair chance. It's also not giving the people that you're working with, the the energy that they deserve. So everything you're saying is the more you can, I love this, the more you get in touch with who you are, what you want and what brings you joy, you're able to live this life that that empowers you to be able to set the boundaries, to be able to say, I don't want to do this shit anymore. And it's mm -hmm. not in a hurtful way. So yeah, keep doing what you're doing, girl, because it's wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you because I intend to, because I cannot do a nine to five. <laughs> oh, nine yeah. to five. I wish there were nine to five jobs. They're all <laughs> eight to six now. <laughs> it really? Oh gosh. I'm so well, out of no, eight to five, I guess. Yeah. Well, tell people um, where they can find you and some of the cool things you offer on your website. Sure. So you can find me over in my corner of the internet is amygreensmith.com. And I like to say all of those 
names are spelled the basic bitch way. <laughs> Amy Green Smith, very simple, especially for somebody so eccentric. <laughs> Like I need such and much more. I gave my parents shit about that for many, many years. Uh, but over on my website, you can find a bunch of freebies. I've got some free hypnosis. I've got uh, a free workbook that helps helps you with speaking up and accessing some self-worth and self-confidence. I have done a podcast for 10 years. So there's a huge library of tons of free resources over there. And I, I teach very much the way I learn, which is which is pretty linear. I need step by step. I need practical tools. I'm I like to mix the woo in with that. But like the two of you, I love a nice episode on our new neuroplasticity. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and then and then also let's talk about spirit guides. So if you're if you're into that and you don't mind an F bomb or two, please come over and and hang out. And then on social, I like any self-respecting Gen Xer. I hang out the most on Instagram uh, under the handle, Hey, Amy Greensmith. And so come say hello. Perfect. And if you guys go to her podcast, Bold Face Truth, you can hear her interview with Denise, which was wonderful. Yes. It was fun. It was a lot of fun because yeah, I, you're, you're just so, you're just so damn genuine. Oh, you're, you're, No. And I, I respect that more than you can know. Is there and I think that's a message for all of us is just be you, just be you. That's it. Because you, you nailed it earlier. That's what's going to attract the people you want to hang out with. That's true. Yeah. I mean, if you're a vanilla ice cream, you're vanilla ice cream, but fuck, I'm like Rocky road with some <laughs> marshmallows and stuff. <laughs> so I'm looking for the other caramel peanut butter lovers, but I'll just say that. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much. We look forward to having you back on to discuss more for empaths about not being a people pleaser and setting those healthy boundaries. Guys, please check her out at amygreensmith.com. And thank you so much for listening. And please remember, as always, to show up, do great work and share your light. Take care.